Time now together, going before the Lord in prayer. So let's bow together and let's uh, turn our attentions to him. Oh, Father, we come to you this morning with great gratitude. Lord, we thank you for the richness of the joy that you offer to us in Jesus in such a way that that joy doesn't, um, isn't a fairy tale or something that we just make up and go with. But Lord, something that's genuine, that resides in our hearts, that's as strong and as eternal and powerful as you are, because Lord, it is a gift from you to us. We thank you for these rich, generous gifts that you give to us, Lord, through Jesus. We lift up those in our members of our attenders, Lord, of those in our midst today, even though that are suffering. God, we know that there are many physical ailments that those recovering from illness in the hospital and in rehab, we pray, God, for your comfort and blessing for them. We pray for your rest restoring power and your encouragement. We pray, oh God, this morning, especially for the Colson family and for Linda in this cancer diagnosis this week and what it means for their family and for her body. And yet, Lord, we lift her up to you with full expectation and your power and your sustaining grace for their family. We pray, O oh God, that you would bring your healing touch to her body. We ask that you would sustain her and Rich and their family with your peace. We pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified through their joy in you, even in the middle of this very difficult time. O oh God, be their sustaining grace. Lord, we lift up our global workers who are abroad this morning and those who are choosing to serve you in obedience to your call and that leads them to be far away from family and all the sentimental things that we enjoy being here with ours and we pray God for your comfort for them and joy. We pray that the family that grows around them would be family in Christ, people who come to know Jesus through faith and to become dear as kin. We pray, oh God, that you would meet with us this morning and open our eyes and our hearts to your word. Would you speak to us, Lord, particularly glorify yourself in our hearts that we would be turned afresh to you. And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed for kids' worship if you are planning on going there. And if you are sticking around in service this morning, big kids, you could take your Bibles and we're going to open up to the letter of 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. When you turn on your radio, maybe your Spotify feed, or you're listening to the wonderful music in the shopping venues around town, one of the songs that comes up over and over again is this. The lines go like this. You will get a sentimental feeling when you hear voices singing, let's be jolly, deck the halls with boughs of holly, right? This is the time of year when we have joy, right? Culturally, sentimentality and getting and giving stuff form the core of what Americans do on Christmas and people around the world, in fact. Kids can be elated or devastated based on what's underneath that Christmas tree on Christmas morning. And we all have that conversation, you know, it feels a little bit different this Christmas, or, or it doesn't really feel like Christmas this year. I don't know if you guys have already had that conversation, especially for those of us who would love to have a white Christmas, and we get a, uh, you know, a, a warm and rainy one this year. And as kids, we would always rank Christmases based on the gifts we got, remembering that year when we got the bike. And, and for us adults, sometimes the conversations tend to be a little bit more down to earth, like... You remember back to that Christmas? That was grandma's last Christmas with us, or that was the Christmas before I lost my job. And so we find ourselves at Christmas with a lot of different mixed feelings. Joy in some Christmases, some pain and some loss. Pain and loss that no gifts can make up for. Exhaustion, I don't know if you're there yet. Have you already been up late wrapping gifts? Sometimes some family traditions that link us as generational, uh, between the generations, and there's always seems to be lots of sweet treats. And so for Christmas, we, we might put on our list of things that we need that extra pair of stretchy pants to get us through January and back into our, uh, our old clothing. But sentiments and celebrations are actually something that God designed and ordained for us. He made us to feel emotions and somehow that reflects his image in us. 
God ordained feasts, and there were times, even amidst sorrowful repentance, that God instructed his people to give gifts and have a meal and celebrate together. And one of such of those times was when Israel was returning from exile back to the destroyed temple or the destroyed temple and city of Jerusalem, and they faced the difficult task of rebuilding. And one of the things that they did is bringing them back to that temple site was to read the law. And Ezra stood up before the people of God, and he read the law. And Israel had a powerful moment because they realized with, fresh, with a fresh sense how far they had fallen, how far they had to go in repentance and returning to God. And so they began to weep uncontrollably and there was great sorrow. And after a while, Ezra told them this. He said, all right, everybody, calm down in a sense. And he said these words, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so something happened amazingly. Their first application of their repentance to God was to keep the Feast of Booths, where they set up temp tents to remind them of their exodus and the travels through the desert and God's ultimate deliverance for them to receive the promised land the first time that they were coming back now to re-inherit, as it were, and resettle. So food and sentiment and joy on those special occasions are something that God ordains. Nehemiah 8.17 concludes the vignette by saying, and there was very great rejoicing. But notice where Nehemiah directs our attentions to the source of their joy and what that joy was to them. He said that the joy of the Lord was their strength. Their situation wasn't particularly joyful. There were dangers without. There was a lot of work to be done. But God was giving them joy to sustain them through all of the hardship that they were about to face. They were being reconciled to God. That was the big deal. Israel was welcomed back to the land because God was moving to bring them back to himself. And that was the substance behind the tokens that they enjoyed in food and sweet drink and presents it was God's mercy, it was God's faithfulness, and God's reconciliation. Last week, we looked at the gift of joy that God gives his people. It goes beyond just sentiment to that unshakable and unstoppable deliverance, the sight that he gives to us, and the freedom that he purchased us on the cross. And all the rays that, of light that we have um, examined over these past three weeks in Advent, the ray of, of peace and of, of joy and uh, all, of, all of God's blessings to us in these lights um, and hope that these all split off from the one that we're going to look at this morning, this ray, this strong, warming beam of love. We have hope because we're loved. We have peace because we're loved by God. We have joy because we are loved. And that love moved God to us in the gift of his son, so we're going to focus this morning on that bright beam of strong, warming love from God's throne to us. Moved him to do the unthinkable, to give us substance for our joy in the flesh and body of Jesus and his presence among us. He has lavished on us with inexhaustible and irretractable affection, the same affection that the Father has for the Son. We're going to bask in this ray of love by looking at three things about love. Love from God is love that sends, sent his son into the world. Love from God is love that summons us to become his sons and daughters. And love that activates us to share that love with others. Read with me 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. And this is... In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice that satisfies God for sin, for our sins. He has sent his son. Love has sent the son John draws us to this primary, sort of prima facie aspect of Jesus' arrival on earth. Jesus showed up 
to declare or to show us the love that is intrinsic in God's character that has been directed toward humanity. The declaration was announced with words and with light, but it was made most importantly not on a page or in a song, but in the very physical presence of the body of Jesus. And John experienced this. He writes about that at the beginning of the book, the letter of 1 John. He says that, that he was able to see and touch and hear Jesus because Jesus had manifested God's love by coming to us. Jesus incarnated bodily in his presence declares the intense love of God for people with personal emphasis. And when we look at the kind of people that God demonstrated his love to, it highlights and magnifies the kind of love that God has and the, the, uh, the scope of God's love. Jesus was sent and he was announced to the lowliest of people on earth first. Think about it. Those angels showed up to declare Jesus' birth to shepherds. Shepherds were way out in the fields, isolated from society. They were dirty. They were the lowliest of the lowly. People didn't even want to touch shepherds because they were kind of gross in that culture. And yet, God showed up to them. You know, he snubbed in his birth announcement in order to show up to shepherds. Pretty much everybody. But in the governors, the Pharisees, the scribes, the emperor of Rome, like all those people got snubbed and the shepherds got the news. That's very humbling to the rich and powerful, isn't it? It's unthinkable exaltation to those of us who are lowly, but it's security to all of us that God from the very height of heaven has the kind of love that goes down to the very lowest depths of earth. We see it too in the choosing of Mary as the mother of God the mother of Jesus. Was she noble? Was she a queen? No, she was an unknown young girl in an obscure family. In the Magnificat, or Mary's Song of Joy, Mary talks about this wonder that she has, that God has moved to use her, that it has to be just of God's grace and his favor upon her. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For no, behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. He's shown mercy on those who fear him. And she talks about his strength shown to the weak and how he has brought down the mighty from their thrones, exalted those who are of humble estate, filled the hungry or poor people with good things. The rich he sent away empty. And he did this because of his mercy. Mary knew as a very young, obscure, poor woman, woman that God's choosing of her meant that he was on a mission of mercy, that this was going to upend the way that humanity worked and showed that corrupt and haughty and oppressive rulers were being rejected by God. The proud might assume themselves of greater worth or deserving the fat and the richness that the poor deserve hardship and that Israel deserves ignominy or shame. But in sending Jesus the Christ through this young Jewish woman into the world, God was demonstrating favor and richness and nourishment regardless of social merit or power by his mercy for all except those who would snub their nose back at God. In fact, every knee would one day bow and tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That goes for the most influential billionaire as much as it does for the powerful dictator, as much as it does for us, the poorest and lowliest of man and woman. Jesus in sending and being sent, Jesus in coming, God in sending him isn't playing a game. So many of us pat ourselves on the back for God and say, you know, you might say, Pastor Ben, I am smarter, more right, generally morally better than the people who reject God. Ooh, that just, that kind of cringy just saying that. And then it sends a little bit of a shiver up your spine, like, wait, I'm better than somebody else? The thing that makes me shiver the most, is, to be honest, is that I've had those same impulses and thoughts inside of me. Yeah, God, you are pretty, pretty lucky to get a catch like me, you know? Pretty great guy, Right? The marvel of love is not that we love God. He's infinitely worthy 
He's glorious, he's beautiful, he's powerful, he's just, he's gracious, he's beneficent. How could we not love someone like that? The marvel of love is that God, despite our sin and brokenness, our enmity against him, our fallenness and rebellion, is that he loves us. And in the most true and deep way possible, he loves us. And it's shown to us by the depths to which he went to, to win us to himself. I repeat the words of 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The love of God is not just a sentiment within God. It is a mighty current of God's movement toward mankind with his goodness and grace and power toward us. It projects from the heart of God in heaven through the presence of Jesus on earth toward all of his image-bearing creatures with the good news of the gospel. The love of God moves from heaven and down through us and impacts people and spreads for good. Now, marveling, our, marveling at ourselves for being so wise and good as to love God is kind of like a paralyzed guy being rescued from certain death from a man who ends up dying in the process. And, and then the, the paralyzed man at the press conference afterwards to explain it all says, actually, I know he moved me off the railroad tracks at the last possible moment and the train killed him at the very moment I was safe. But the real story here is how remarkable I am for being this grateful. Other lesser, lesser people might have taken this for granted, you know? And we would instinctively be shocked and angry at that guy thinking, man, that guy's blind. Who does he think he is? How can he, standing here today because of the man who died, make himself out to be the hero of the story? It steals honor from the man who sacrificed his life to rescue that man, right? And yet in the council of the Trinity from eternity past, the father took his son and sent him for us to die in our place. So we have to ask ourselves the same question that's, that's raised just by that act from God. What would it take for us to be willing to sacrifice our own children to rescue someone else? I mean, I, I love all of you here today, but I wouldn't give my son up for anybody, right? I love him. He's my flesh and blood. And yet God, the Father in heaven, there must have been something in his heart that drove him, that pressed him to make a plan where he would give his precious and only son for us. It has to be. It has to be that in the heart of God, the value that he puts on us because of his grace and love is so high that it was worth it for him to send his own son. <laughs> That's overwhelming. How do you process that? That God has that much love within him. He looked at you and he looked at me and the love and compassion that he had for us arising from his unrelenting heart of love rose to the value of the cost of sending his one and only son. And so the hymn writer and the poet put it this way, the love of God is greater far than any tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The wandering child is reconciled by God's beloved son. The aching soul made whole and priceless pardon won. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and everyone a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. We rightly adore Jesus and our adoration of Jesus is but a reflex of the deep and eternal and powerful love of God for us as proven through Jesus Christ. Our joy that God's rightful glory be realized is our good because in love God has inseparably united our good 
and his glory by uniting us to himself. That means that every time God is glorified, our goodness is at heart in that and his love is being poured out through us in that. We see the possibility of love existing because love reached out to us and when we experience that love, our hearts fill instead of with pride, with humble love in return for God's infinite grace and mercy to us. But God's love is not universally realized, is it? Experienced, I mean. For some people, the confession of moral guilt, the acceptance of accountability before God, to accept a God who has ultimate and eternal priority in his glory over me is distasteful and competition with me and my own individual sovereignty is like death. That's bad news to some people. And so we find that Jesus is sent to those who will receive him. John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. How could it be that people could reject God's gift of love? How could it be that we would reject wholeness and healing and life and all of these blessings? The humility that Jesus came with is part of it. Jesus is associated with poverty. He died a humiliating death. Only criminals who were not citizens and slaves could be crucified. And Jesus was crucified. Jesus associated with and loved the unimpressive and the downtrodden. He was unrelenting in his reflection on the heart. And these things defy our flesh and our worldly impulses. It might be one thing if we could just step back and say, yes, God, you do love me so much because I'm worth loving and worth forgiving too. Isn't that your job to forgive people? I've heard people say that as they justify their sins, right? But it's quite another thing for us to take Jesus for who he is and what he has to say because that is the sound of death to our flesh, the sound of an end of our association with the world as comrades and the dismantling of all the props that we have made for ourselves to say I'm worthy and I'm superior to other people. So there's the not receiving part. But what about for those who did receive a little bit later in the next verses, John says in John 1, 12 through 14, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The love of God comes from the heights of heaven to the lowest parts of earth in the sending of his son. But in that sending, there is a summons for you and there's a summons for me to receive the gift of who Jesus is. And notice that it's not a what that we receive. He doesn't say receive the forgiveness of sins. What does he says to all who did receive Him. It's him, it's Jesus that we receive. God himself, the right to become sons of God. So God sends his son to welcome us into his family as we receive his son. When we come to the tree on Christmas morning, we receive a gift by taking hold of it. It becomes our possession. We open it, we use it. And it's the same thing that we do with Jesus. We receive him as our own all of who he is in his identity, Savior and Son of God. We lay hold on him, just like we've laid hold on truth and life. We found grace. That's what Jesus is to us, and so we hold on to him. We receive him for who he is. We hold on to Jesus because he's life itself, and we're going to look a little bit more at that tonight. But it's also why it says those who receive Jesus by faith are born of God. Receiving Jesus and what God does with inside of a person is not just a mental act. It's not a facelift that God puts on us or marionette strings that he uses to dance around our lifeless bodies. No, he makes us in a new category of existence, it says, born not of the will of the flesh nor of man, but of God, a newness of life, the life of Christ within us. 
Our inclusion in Christ, our adoption as sons in Jesus means Ill, incalculable elevation for us. We enjoy now the favor of Christ before the Father. We enjoy now the standing of Christ before the Father because of the gift of Jesus. We've come alive in Jesus and we live in him. Let's also note as we receive the love of Jesus to also note the nature of that love. Mary got it when she processed what it meant for somebody like her to be selected as the mother of Jesus to bear the Savior. So for us, we need to process through what this arrangement that God has made means for us. John prompts us to do that in 1 John 3, 1. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. And so we ask ourselves, what is the kind of love that God has lavished on us through Jesus? Well, it has to be fatherly, right? Because he's welcomed us as children. So that must mean he wants to be our dad and he wants to care for us and welcome us into his family. It must be intentional because he made all the arrangements so that this could be possible for us in sending the son and offering us salvation. He must be merciful and gracious too, right? Because we were guilty and weak and broken. But Jesus rescued us from the flames of hell. He rescued us from enmity with him and complicity with Satan and the fallen angels. He rescued us, people who were without spark of hope due to our utter and complete bankruptcy of merit before him. People who do deserve the darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this place, God has reached out of heaven and at the cost of his one and only son, made sons and daughters of us. If that's what God's doing at Christmas in the sending of his son, the savior to the world, it must be the intent of God for that kind of a gift to spread. If that's the kind of motivation and energy God has to rescue people. And so it says so in our most famous verse, right? John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son in the world, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I'm sure you've picked up on this as you've imagined an, a life with Jesus and, and, uh, and projected in your own mind what it must look like to follow him. But the, the life that Jesus gives us and the way that Jesus saves us has implications on the rest of our lives and who we are as people and how we go about life. Think about it for a second. What if in that scenario with the paralyzed man who got saved off the railroad tracks, that he was, he was pushed off the tracks, but it, simultaneously he was delivered from death. He was also healed. And he got up from his wheelchair for the first time in his life and began to walk and began to, to live life with full mobility again, restored to function. Being given life at such a cost and being restored to, to function and to, 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 to wholeness would recharacterize every moment of his life, right? All of a sudden, he would have to say, every moment that I live is now a gift from God. And everything that I do now is a miracle because I have been made alive through the miracle of healing and so it is for us when we receive the good news of Jesus and forgiveness of sins and the new birth and new life of healing. Every moment now is a gift and everything that we can do is a miracle. How could we go back and throw away the life that God has given to us? What a, what a, what a travesty that would be. And so we can see in the gift of God for us the kind of life that he calls us to live. A life that is is, is in the image of his grace and mercy and forgiveness and of his giving and going and calling to him. So we'll share with other unworthy people the gift of ultimate worth, the light of Christ, life, mercy, self-giving and self-sacrifice that we've received in Jesus will become theirs. First John 3, John traces it out. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. Being a child of God has implications. He talks about that. He says that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. And a little bit later it says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now that passage, I don't believe, is teaching that we have to be perfect in order to be saved. But what it is saying is that if you get what Jesus did on the cross and you get what salvation is about, turning from sin and being rescued from it, then that charts a path for your life away from sin and toward righteousness with Jesus. That's what it means to be a child of God. And so we find the axiom behind salvation is that everything that God is to us and everything that God gives to us is something that he intends to make out of us and to give back through us to other people. It goes for grace, it goes for forgiveness, it goes for mercy, it goes for reconciliation, it goes for everything that God gives to us. As he is in this world, so we are called to be. We've lit a candle this morning to love in our Advent wreath. The candle stands for the love of God that was incarnated in the person of Jesus and come from heaven from, for us. And we say, behold what manner of love the Father has for us. But it's also a reminder to us that the candle that we lit in love this morning is a candle that is to be lit within us as well. The call of God's love is twofold for us both to receive his love in its fullness but also to reflect the light of his love back to other people as we've said. We receive the light of Christ's love as we receive him in his wholeness without reservation or condition. You, Jesus, are the son of God. And we've looked at him as son and savior and sacrifice and sovereign. We say, Jesus, you're king. I receive you as king, reign in my life. You're my sacrifice for sin. You are my righteousness. Jesus, I take you as my righteousness. Jesus, you are the son of God. I receive you as the divine presence of God, the divine light of God, the truth and the way. Jesus, you are the son of God to me and I receive you as that. And Jesus, you are my savior. You're the one who rescues me. These are the things, these bright rays of hope and peace and joy and love, these are the things that make life truly alive. And there is no gift or wish or sentiment or novelty that even have any whiff of substance to them without that hope and peace and joy and love shed abroad in our hearts. Those are the kind of gifts that pervade and invade our lives even in the middle of loss and loneliness and longing. The gift of Jesus that is always given to us. And so we receive Jesus, but we also reflect him. Did you know that Jesus is still bodily on earth? So wait a minute, Ben, let's go. Hop in the car, let's go see him. Well, how can Jesus be bodily in heaven and bodily on earth if he's limited to a body? Well, maybe it's a different way of thinking of it, but if Jesus inhabits us, as he says he does in the word of God, and we are embodied people and we're united to the body of Christ, then in that very real way, we are an embodiment of Jesus in this world. And so that's why I say we're not the light but we're called to reflect the light as Jesus' presence in a dark place, in your family gathering, in your workplace, among your friends. We are the visible presence of Jesus to this world and his voice of hope and love to hearts. And so we invite others, high and low alike, to receive Jesus just the way we did. And God's light begins to shine through us and invade the darkness through us. His love becomes alive in us and sends us back out to the whole world. That's how the richness and the substance, the refreshment of Christmas becomes ours. Whether or not it's white, whether or not it's even happy, because Christ is ours and he is alive in us by faith. Let's bow for prayer. Oh God, we thank you that the kind of love that you give to us is not the kind of love like we watch in the movies or we see in greeting cards that we know is something we're trying to, to project, but it's circumstantial and, and somewhat of a dream. But the love that you give us is substantive, that the gifts that you give, Lord Jesus, are the 
true substance of what it means to be really alive, to have wholeness and joy and hope is what makes all of life meaningful. And God, it's a gift of your grace for which we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being sent, for coming for us and for facing the horrors of the cross in order to pay for our sins. We thank you, O oh God, for demonstrating the power, the depth, the scope of your love by coming to the lowliest so that we could be assured that we are not counted out of the message of Jesus, the message of Christmas, the message of hope. And we pray, O oh God, that you would cause your light to be bright within us, that we would be reflections of your love and a voice calling other people to receive the gift that you offer in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.